Hello viewers, today on our Lancentia Hub episode, we are going to digest some medical nursing questions and how to go about the answers, explaining each rationale of justifying our answer. Remember, medicine or medical nursing is very easy to pass if only you understand the pathophysiology of the condition and you are able to apply as a student in your exams. To begin with, our first question for the day a patient with gastric ulcer will probably describe the pain as A, generalized abdominal pain intensified by moving, B, intermittent colicky flank pain, C, a burning epigastric pain after eating, and D, a gowning sensation relieved by food. Viewers, in this question, you could see that a condition named gastric ulcer was mentioned. This takes us back to ulcers back in school. What is ulcer? Ulcer can simply be described as a circumscribed ulceration of the gastrointestinal tract, which can be found in the esophagus, the stomach, or the duodenum. When we talk about gastric ulcer, we are simply talking about ulcers that are found in the stomach. Now, in medicine, we have two main or major type of ulcers that we mostly discuss, gastric ulcers and duodenal ulcers. Now, when you hear the word gastric ulcer, this should tell you that that ulcer is occurring in the stomach. And when you hear the duodenal ulcer, you should know that that type of ulcer is occurring in the small intestine. Because when you take the small intestine, we have three major portions of the small intestine. We have the first part called the duodenum, the second part called the jejunum, and the third part called the ileum. And so an ulcer occurring in the duodenum will be classified as a duodenal ulcer. Now, in comparing and contrasting the two types of ulcers, how would the student nurse be able to identify them when it comes in the MCQs? Now, for gastric ulcer, as I earlier on said, this is a type of ulcer that occurs in the stomach. Now, this type of ulcer, one of the classical symptoms that comes with it is that with the gastric ulcers, the pain is intensified when one eats. The pain is intensified when one ingests in food. And the pain is relieved when the person vomits the food out. These are some of the classical signs associated with gastric ulcer. But for the donor ulcer, the pain is relieved when the patient eats, and the pain is worsened when the stomach is empty, i.e. when the patient is hungry. These are some few classical distinguishing between gastric ulcers and duodenal ulcers. Now, the question was asking us about gastric ulcer. Again, for gastric ulcer, after eating, you will feel a burning upper sensation or burning upper gowning pain. That is the description of the pain. A burning upper gowning pain that is intensified upon eating. So the gastric ulcer, the pain is intensified when you eat food. Whereas in the donor ulcer, the pain is seen when one what, injects or when one is hungry and the pain is relieved when one what, eats food. Now, looking at the question back on the screen, they are saying that a patient with gastric ulcer will probably describe the pain as what? Option A says a generalized abdominal pain intensified by moving. That is not a classical symptom associated with gastric ulcer, and so option A is out of our context. Option B is saying that an intermittent colicky flank pain. Now, this is a type of situation that describes certain conditions like cholecystitis, volvulus, intestinal obstruction. Once they mention colicky flank pain, these are symptoms associated with intestinal or disorders or obstruction. And so option B will play no role in also an answer. Option C is saying that a burning epigastric pain after eating. Yes, this is a classical symptom of gastric ulcer. And so option C will be our appropriate answer. Option D description there is saying that a gowning sensation relieved by food. Once they tell out it is relieved by food, 
then you should know that they are describing what duodenal ulcer and so in summary duodenal ulcer is a garlic sensation that is what relieved by food but in gastric ulcers the pain is worsened when the person eats and the pain is relieved when the person what vomits the food out these are the two comparisons between gastric ulcers and duodenal ulcer our next question which reads which of the following causes hemorrhagic anemia a a decreased absorption of nutrients in the gastrointestinal tract b physical injury to either external or internal structures with severe blood loss and d endocrine changes in the body viewers a condition as we mentioned here called anemia what is anemia in medicine Anywhere you see any with starting with A or beginning with A or AN means there's an absence of something. Now, EMIA, E M I A, has to do with the blood. And so, anywhere you see any with EMIA has to do with the blood. So, anemia is simply what lack of blood or low blood level, which is mostly associated with what the hemoglobin count. We have Classification of anemias. When we want to classify anemia, we classify anemia looking at the morphologic characteristics of the red blood cells. Morphology simply means the shape. Or you classify anemia according to the etiology, the cause of the anemia. Now, when we go under the cause of the anemia, we have three things playing out over there. You can have one, hemolytic anemia. This is a type of anemia caused by excessive distraction of red blood cells. So, in the way, the hemolysis in medicine is simply the excessive distraction of the red blood cell. And so, any condition that will tell you causes the distraction of the red blood cells and lead to anemia, we will classify that as a hemolytic anemia cause. Example can be sickle cell disease, malaria. These conditions can break down the red blood cells before their 120 days elapses the second cause of anemia can be hemorrhagic from the word hemorrhage hemorrhage simply means severe blood loss or excessive bleeding so any condition that to happen for a patient to lose excess blood we will classify that cause as a hemorrhagic anemia and the last one is the hypopolyphrative anemia when we say hypopolyphrative, it means that there is lack of production of all the red blood cells in the bone marrow. And so any condition that will lead to the lack of the synthesis of the red blood cell will be classified as a hypopolyphrative cause of anemia. And so back to this question on the screen, it was simply asking us about the causes of anemia. The question was asking us about the causes of anemia. And so with all what have been described, you will see that option B, which is physical injury to either external or internal structure with severe blood loss will be our appropriate answer in respect to hemorrhagic anemia. This is because it is being accompanied by severe blood loss and that classically explains severe bleeding or hemorrhage. Our next question, which reads, the predominant cation in the intracellular compartment is A. Potassium B. Calcium C. Magnesium Viewers, this question seeks to examine us on our various compartments in the body that is within the cells and outside the cells. When we see intracellular, intra in medical prefaces simply means inside something then cellular simply means what cells and so when i say intracellular i'm simply talking about what inside the cell then when i say extracellular i'm talking about outside the cell now inside the cell the most predominant ion or electrolyte that you see inside the cell that is positively charged called a cation when we say a cation a cation is a positively charged ion whilst 
an anion is a negatively charged ion or electrolyte. And so with this, the absence of the cation that is positively charged, and when you go inside the cell, the most predominant electrolyte or cation over there is potassium. As well as when you go outside the cell, the most predominant is sodium. And so the question back on the screen was asking us as the predominant cation in the intracellular compartment is what? So here we have no choice than to take potassium as our correct answer. Next question. Which reads? The nurse is teaching a mother of a child diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. The mother asks why her child must inject insulin and cannot take pills as her uncle does. Which reply is most appropriate? A. Because a child's pancreas is less developed than an adult. B. Your child may be able to take pills when he's older. And C. The only way to replace insulin is by injection. Viewers, this is another interesting topic that has been raised. In fact, most common that we have in our system, diabetes mellitus. What condition is this? This is a disorder of the endocrine system, specifically the pancreas, where there is a problem with the cells that synthesize insulin. In diabetes mellitus, we have about three major types. We have the type 1 diabetes mellitus, which are also called the insulin dependent. And then we have the type two, which are also called the non-insulin dependent. Then we have the gestational diabetes, which is mostly common in pregnancy. With the type one diabetes, the paramount problem is that the cells that produces the insulin, which is the beta cells, are not there. They are destroyed either by autoimmune causes. And so they are not even there at all to produce the insulin. And so for these categories of people, they will always be placed on what insulin therapy for life. That is why they are also called the insulin dependent patients. And so when the question has said that somebody is having type 1 diabetes mellitus, you should also know that such a patient will always be given insulin as his treatment. Type 2, what is happening in this type of diabetes? In type 2 diabetes, the problem could be one. The cells that produces the insulin are there, but they are not producing insulin sufficiently to meet the body's demands. Or they are producing the insulin, but the cells are rejecting them. Some examples of cells that reject insulin action are the fat cells. That explains the reason why metformin is given to obese patients to help prevent diabetes. Because in obese people, they are prone to the rejection of insulin because of the excess fat in their cells. And so for type 2 patients, they are always, almost every time, managed with drugs. Example is the metformin that they are given. And so when we say a type 2 diabetes mellitus, these patients are managed on drugs. While the type 1, they are always given with insulin injection. And so in the question, the mother was asking, why her uncle is always taking pills but not the injection and the son is rather or the child is rather taking the insulin injection and so classically with all what has been explained you should understand that it is because of the type of diabetes the child is having that is why we are giving the insulin and so back to the question on your screen you will see that it is the appropriate for the option c to be the correct choice of answer because the only way to replace insulin is by injection. Hence, option C, our correct answer. Furthermore, the classical distinguishing factor between type 1 diabetes and type 2 diabetes is the injection of insulin, which is always common in type 1 diabetes mellitus. However, there are certain cases that you can give insulin in type 2, such as in severe burns, when there is diabetic ketoacidosis, or where there is surgical operation. These are some instances where you can give insulin in a type 2 diabetic patient. But more often, insulin injections are given to the type 1 diabetes mellitus patient. 
our next question, which reads, A patient with diabetic mellitus says, I cannot eat big meal. I prefer eating snacks throughout the day. The nurse will explain that, A. Regulated food intake is basic to diabetic control. B. Small frequent meals are better for easy digestion. And D. Large meals can bring about weight problems. Viewers, diabetes mellitus is playing out again here, where the patient is seeking on dietary management in diabetes control. Now, with diabetes mellitus, there's always problem with sugar metabolism or insulin moving glucose into the cell. And so with diabetic patient, one of the treatment modalities is diet regulation. Diets or dietitian regulate diet for them so that they can help control the sugar level. With this explained, let us look at the options spelled out. A says that regulated food intake to the basic control of diabetic. B says that small frequent meals are better for easy digestion. And C says that large meals can bring about weight problems. Viewers, as explained earlier, one of the management modalities of diabetes mellitus is diet. And so it's appropriate for the nurse to tell the patient that a regulated food intake is basic to diabetic control, which makes our option A the correct answer. I hope you all had an interesting time on this episode. With the questions were discussed, and the rationale given appropriately. I will encourage all of you to continue to share the link, subscribe to the channel if you are yet to do that, and leave your comment in our comment section, as well as any questions you want to ask us, you can ask. And also follow us on our Telegram channel, Lancentia Hub, for a brief interaction. See you another time on Lancentia Hub episode. Thank you.